Assalamu alaikum and welcome to tonight's live show on Imam Hussein TV. In tonight's live show, we'll be looking at the character about around one personality indeed. The Holy Quran mentions in at least two places around the character of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, possessing sublime morality as Surah Qalam verse 4 talks about. Surah Ahzab also in verse 21 talks about him having exemplary moral conduct. Inshallah, we'll be looking at these areas of what is morality, akhlaq as it's termed in Arabic, and how we can actually focus on this. In tonight's show, we'll be looking at a number of different areas. First of all, around the biography around the Holy Prophet, the scarcity, as it were, of the availability of sources. We shall also look at the narrations available. What is reliable? What is not reliable? We shall also look at what sort of moral compass, compass he is, the pivot of Islam, being known as Habibullah, the closest to Allah, Al-Mustafa, the chosen one, Shahr, uh, Bashar al-Khair, the good human, as it were, and Insan al-Kamil. Inshallah, tonight we shall be looking also at the areas around the wars that took place. What sort of social factors should we interact and incorporate from the Holy Prophet? How should we interact with each other? What is akhlaq? How can we engage with other humans, non-Muslims as well? Also with, our, with the Holy Prophet's enemies, what took place at that time? Should people marry young? We shall be looking also at that. So with me tonight, inshallah, I'm fortunate to be joined with Dr. Sayyid Amar Naqshwani. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah. Thank you for joining us, inshallah. And we'll be looking at this great topic around the great prophet, as it were. Um, just before we go into the um, program content, what I want to do is also focus on this week in particular, or the upcoming days now, because this is going to be now the period leading up to the wafat or the shahada of the Holy Prophet. So we can also look at perhaps which particular school of thought also commemorates his shahada, as it were, why that's important. What, what should we take, as it were, from the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. Um, so just to start with, inshallah, we'll look at other verses of the Holy Quran, inshallah, in due course. But just to start with, why does the Holy Quran talk so nobly around the character of the Holy Prophets? And also, what sort of available sources do we have around the biography? Uh, first and foremost, our condolences go out to the Muslim Ummah on, the, on this, the week of the death of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family. Without a doubt, a figure that all the Muslims are united on in terms of their guidance, in terms of their love, uh, and in terms of being the most important man in the religion of Islam and the greatest creation of God. So my condolences goes out to everybody and that without a doubt the Ja'fari school is the school that seeks to honor the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and his family both in remembering the day of his birth and the day of his death. I don't think you'll find any other school in the religion of Islam that remembers the Holy Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and his family in terms of Rabi' al awwal and when he was born and in terms of the month of Safar and when he died and it's quite ironic because one of the ways in which uh, certain people tried to attack the Shia was by saying that we don't value the Holy Prophet peace be upon him and his family or by throwing accusations against the whole of the Twelver community that we favor others above the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. Many times I have people who, when I've lectured even within our own communities, who will come to me and say that we hear a lot about the other members of the Ahlul Bayt, such as Imam Ali alayhi salam, or such as Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. But how about the life of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family? And I think many of them don't realize that on the first level, there is no school in this religion that tomorrow night and Wednesday night will gather in their millions around the world, all wearing black, all going to the mosque to honor this man and remember the words, peace be upon him the day he was born and the day he died. And of course, the day he is raised alive again when we all hope to be alongside him. But alongside that, of course, there is a need for us to try and be a reflection 
of the principles by which he lived his life. And you're absolutely right when you asked me the question about the scarcity of sources in reconstructing this man's character because no doubt if a person's going to try and look for the earliest works in relation to the biographies of the Prophet peace be upon him and his family uh, then you're finding yourself hard pressed to find a biography written about his life let's say a few years after he's passed away as in normally uh, professors at universities will go straight away to the likes of Ibn Hisham or the likes of Tabari in the hope of somehow salvaging something from the likes of Ibn Ishaq as an example. But in terms of the school of Ahlul Bayt salam, there is something fundamental for us and that is A, a great amount of the legacy, a great amount of the literature and understanding of the life of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, can be found within the Holy Quran. You know, I know that there are many who may say, well, where are the books of hadith on the biography of the Prophet, peace be upon his family? But the Quran itself gives us a brilliant understanding of the life of this man, especially his years as a Prophet. Number two, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, salam, to us are an extension of that prophetic light. When we say they're an extension of the prophetic light, when Imam Ali alayhi salam says something, that's as if the Prophet was saying it. When Imam al-Sadiq says something, that's as if the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, is saying it. There is no way that the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, would come and guide us in this 23-year period and then just leave us in a state of confusion or a state of despair as to how we then develop and evolve with this message that he so wonderfully looked after. <clears throat> that's why you find many of the narrations will point to the fact that in the same way the Prophet peace be upon his family looked after revelation the likes of Ali son of Abu Talib were the ones who looked after interpretation so when you've got for example people asking me that where's your quotes from the Prophet peace be upon him and his family or even some of the Shia some of the Shia will say that in many of our majalis we hear qala al baqir qala al-sadiq qala al baqir qala al-sadiq when we say qala al baqir qala al-sadiq that is the very words of the Prophet peace be upon him and his family because the first of them is Muhammad the middle one is Muhammad and the last of them is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so the Quran not only has a surah called Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, but the Quran also allows us to understand different aspects of his moral conduct we if we neglect the Quran miss out on a lot of his most wonderful moments of compassion, mm -hmm. wonderful moments of mercy, wonderful moments of patience, wonderful moments of grief. Yeah. These, these moments are moments which not only do we see a development in the growth of his moral character, but also are areas we can relate absolutely. to. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And I think also when it comes to the sources, when we're looking at Al-Kafi or Man La Yahdharahu Al-Faqih or Al-Tahdeeb or Al-Istibsar, these four canonical works, we have narrations in there about the Holy Prophet, for example, which we can take. But then there are other works which are dedicated to the life and the sermons of the Holy Prophet in Shi'i history, okay. which I think are neglected, whether it's of scholars from the 4th century or scholars of the 21st century. Right. So, for example, Tuhaf al Uqul, for example, um, is a wonderful work um, which many have neglected. And while, yes, I'm not going to use it for my jurisprudential rulings, I'm still going to be able to benefit so much from Ibn Harran's work on the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. And likewise, Sunan al Nabi of Allama Taba Tabai, for example, yeah. you know, um, as an example of a work where we can learn about the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family and how he lived his life, um, about his conduct with others. Because ultimately as human beings, what are we except our morality? The moment the morals die, the society dies. Absolutely. Absolutely. So within Shia history, 
we have works outside of the canonical works which were dedicated to the lifestyle, the etiquettes, the moral, the, con the morality, the conduct of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. Yes, I mean, absolutely. I mean, there's, we see numerous narrations, at least in English anyway, that I've encountered that where the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and the Holy Ahlulbayt, alayhi salam, how they have treated non-Muslims, Jews, Christians, and even atheists at times. And how, what do you think, in terms of the narrations now, you've, you've touched upon examples in terms of what the greatest personality, the closest one to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has left, as it were. But in terms of narrations, how should one test them if, if we can? It's a great question because I think if we're not careful, we may be able or we may be reconstructing the wrong Prophet Muhammad. Right. And the wrong Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, can leave a sour taste in the lives of Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Yeah. Depends who's telling you about the man. Exactly. I think that's fundamental. Exactly. And the Reliability, and there are certain characters, with all due respect to them, okay. they may be revered in other schools in Islam, but for me they're not a source uh, which I have to revere or a source of knowledge that I have to rely on. Yes. When Salman Rushdie wrote the Satanic Verses, he could not have written a work like that unless there were extant certain works on the Prophet or certain narrations about his life, about his sexual behaviors, about his behaviors with his wives, about the dreams that he was having, about his hygiene, mm -hmm. that may leave a sour taste when a non-Muslim reads them. I've read certain works which talk about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. In all honesty, I wouldn't follow him as a Prophet if that's the way he lived yeah. his life. Yeah. I'll be very frank. Sure. Why should I sit here and claim that I have to revere a man when there are books that talk about how he was with his wives in their periods mm. or how he was with his wives under the bed sheet yeah. when Gabriel would walk in or the odd companion would walk in who the angels were shy of. Yes. And because of those narrations, I believe that there are two Prophet Muhammad's who emerge. I believe there's a Prophet Muhammad who emerges, which is not the one I believe in, or not the one that I follow. There's a, a, a real lack of etiquette or even ethics in the way that he is dealing with those close to him, let alone those far away from him. Yeah. He's looking at girls playing on swings at the age of six. I don't know what that behavior is all about, but it's there in certain famous Islamic works. Yeah which many Muslims rely on That's right. in terms of guidance. Yeah. You know, like you're looking at works, you know, the Sahih Sitta, for example, are seen as, as, as fundamental works, Bukhari and Muslim and Tirmidhi, Nasa'i, Abu Dawood and Ibn Majah. To me, they're, you know, they're not a, a source that I have to follow. To other Muslims, they are a source that they rely upon in terms of trying to gain an understanding of our history, our ethics, our theology in some cases. For me personally, if I want to understand the life of my Prophet, peace be upon his family, the Qur'an and the explanation of the verses of the Qur'an from the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. First and foremost, because he's the one who said, I leave behind for you two weighty things. Hold on to them and you will never go astray. The Qur'an and my Ahlul Bayt. Nobody is as learned as the Ahlul Bayt. I defy anyone to tell me that they have someone who's more learned than Imam Ali alayhi salam amongst the companions or has the ability to tell me that Hassan and Hussein have less knowledge than anyone who lived in their time. So when I'm gonna look at an ayah of the Holy Quran, for example, let's say, وَإِذَا سَرَّ النَّبِيُّ لَا بَعْضِ أَزْوَاجِ حَدِيثًا in Surah 66 verse 3, the Prophet told his wife a secret okay. and she divulged her secret to her friend. I want to know what the Ahlul Bayt say happened there. Mm. If I see an eye in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu in jaa'akum fasiqun bi naba'in fatabayyanu. Yes. Oh, you who believe when a wicked person comes to you with news, verify that news. I want to see what Ahlul Bayt say happened on that. Absolutely. Ultimately, 
If in jurisprudence there was a school such as the Maliki school, where Malik bin Anas relied on the practice of the people of Medina, considering the people of Medina are the closest to have seen and have met or have known of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, are you telling me those people of Medina are closer than the very people who used to sit around him and who the incident of the Kisa was revealed about them? Therefore, when someone says to me, who's the real Prophet Muhammad? When I see the likes out there of, for example, Hitchens before or Sam Harris now and others, and even when I see someone like Jordan Peterson asking questions such as, I'm wondering about Muhammad, was he a warmonger? Why did wars begin? Or about his other behaviors which others question his lustful ways. I can't blame them because within our literature, it's there. The moment you started to rely on people who a few years earlier were pagans, mm -hmm. in some cases, some of the most ferocious enemies of the man yes. were the ones who were the most involved in narrating narrations about him. Yeah, Imagine you hated the man a few years earlier, now you're in charge of what's narrated about him. And so for me, the moment I saw the Umayyads come into power and Abu Sufyan's kids now have the pens in their hands and you have Marwan ibn al-Hakam one side and you have, for example, Ziyad bin Abi the other, Mughira bin Shu'ba the other, others and others, which we won't mention because every time you mention such names, there's an inferiority complex of people who are like, oh, don't get sectarian. Okay, so I won't mention those names. Sure. For me personally, there's nothing like going to Ahlul Bayt. Uh, when you go to Al Muhammad, they'll tell you about their grandfather mm -hmm. better than people who we don't know about their family heritage telling us about our Prophet. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, we'll talk about certain verses alluding to the f how the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and the Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam, um, reflected and showed akhlaq to people. And we also come back to what akhlaq was shown to them, what respect was given to them mm, mm. further into the program. However, just for the moment, what, what, I mean, just for the masses here and also myself, what sort of definition should we take in terms of character? Why is it so important? I mean, you, you touched upon the point that without morality we're nothing and so on and so forth why is it so important because and i'm sure you've heard that there's a number of non-muslims or a number of people out there who are good people and they've got good manners they've got good etiquette they're polite they respect people why is this so highly focused as it were what is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trying to tell us as the ummah 1400 years back and even now, in terms of development? I think there's a couple of key points that need to be understood when it comes to uh, the concept of morality around the Prophet, peace be upon his family, in particular within Shi'ism. Right. Shi'ism first and foremost believes that there is an ability innately within the human being to differentiate between that which has goodness and that which has evil, okay. irrespective of what religion you believe in. That sometimes in our legal and theological works, you come across that which is Hassan and that which is Qabih, okay. Husn and Qabh. These are fundamental concepts in Shia theology. That there are objective, intrinsic moral values which we're able to ascertain okay. as human beings, irrespective of our religion. You go to someone out there now who's not a Muslim and you ask them, <clears throat> is it good to tell the truth? They'll say yes. They don't even know about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family. They may never have even heard of the Quran. Is it bad to lie? They'll say yes. Intrinsic within us is that ability to rationally conceive the difference between that which is good and that which is bad. Other schools in Islam, notably the Ash'ari school, theologically, said what Allah ordains as good is good. Lying is bad because Allah said it's bad, not because we realize it's bad. 
telling the truth is good because Allah says it's good. Not because we realize that it's good. On the contrary, we say no. We, Allah has given us the ability. And in Usul al-Fiqh, when you study the Quran, you study Sunnah, you study Ijma' and then when you study Aql within the Shi'i principles, you come to Mustaqillat Aqliya. And within that discussion is this ability to comprehend rationally the difference between good and evil. Therefore, someone asked the question, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enjoins upon us to do good and justice, why would he need to enjoin if it's rationally or intrinsically there? He's only asking us to observe that which we perceive. Because the human being, if you don't ask them to observe it, they become negligent with yeah, it. Absolutely. True? Yes. When there is a God-given moral guidance and command, it helps our growth towards perfection. Therefore, you find on the first level, within the Shi'i school, morality is so great that we believe that we as human beings were given that gift of differentiating between good. But who is the role model in that area? Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and then the final prophet of God himself says something interesting. Listen to this very important line, which in English, I think in many cases, translated wrongly. In English, in many lectures, we may have said something like that the Prophet Muhammad's mission, if someone asks now the viewers out there, why do you, what is the mission of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family? You find many people out there will say things like, well, his mission, well, you know, to bring peace and just, no, he actually summarizes it. He says, my mission was to, and many of us will normally say it as, my mission was to um, come and bring morals to mankind. No, that's not the translation. Innama, my soul mission. Innama is not a word that you simply use at the beginning of the sentence. No, there is some a quality, an attribute. Innama lil hasr, you're trying to understand at this moment that there's a particular mission that's being spoken of. Okay. My sole mission for which I have been sent is to complete the mission of those prophets before me. I'm no different to Christ than Moses and Noah. And sadly, many Muslims, when they talk about the Prophet Muhammad, they do not show that there is a clear line of God's divine light permeated through these Abrahamic figures. My sole mission is to complete the mission of those prophets who came before me to ensure that the most sublime morals are that which are given to mankind. Notice makaram al-akhlaq. We have a dua in the holy month of Ramadan which many of our viewers have recited known as dua makaram al-akhlaq. Makaram al-akhlaq, mahasan al-akhlaq. What's the difference? You have mahasan al-akhlaq, you have makaram. Mahasan, good manners. Okay. Makaram sublime. Right. But what's the difference? In Mahasan al Akhlaq, you, Muhammad, for example, done me a favor where one day my car was broken down, you came and helped me. Yeah. So I'm going to say, one day, if I see your car broken down, I'm going to come and help you. Tit for tat. Show good Akhlaq back because you helped me. Yes. So I'll help you. Makaram is whether you help me or you don't. When I see you in trouble, I'll help you. In Mahasan al-Akhlaq, when someone's done good to me, I do good back to them. In Makaram al-Akhlaq, irrespective whether you've done good to me or no, I'll always do good back towards you. It's a sublime morality. The world that we live in today is a world of tit for tat. It is, it is, yes. Uh, you invited me to the wedding, I'll invite you to my wedding. 
You came to my funeral, my dad's funeral, my mom's funeral, I'll come to yours. If you didn't invite me to your wedding, I won't invite you to my wedding. If you didn't give me a gift when you came home, I won't take your gift when you went home. If you didn't call me when your baby was born, and that's where the Muslims are far from the Islam of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Because with our Prophet, how many times, and this story we tell our children from a young age. I'm sure from a young age you were also told this story, I was told this story, before I even started narrating the story myself one day. The Jewish lady who used to throw trash at him. Yes, yes. All of us have heard the story. But why was that story so important? Because that story highlighted Makarim versus Mahasim. It's highlighted that as a Muslim, the biggest test you face, the one who hasn't shown good to you, will you show them good when they need it? Okay. This permeates in the character of the Ahlul Bayt in a sublime manner. Wow. We'll come to them one by one. Yes, First one, absolutely. when she, that Jewish lady, it's, very, it's a time of tension of course, because there are certain Jewish tribes who have a problem with him. And here you've got this lady, and this lady is throwing trash at him. And when she's throwing this trash at him, every morning, imagine you go past someone's house, they're throwing trash at you. You know what we would do? You know, we'd, we'd be over there. In a... But he would continue walking, continue, continue, continue. Until one day there was no trash at him when he walked past the house. Now we, in many cases today, find that many of our listeners on the television are victims of Islamophobia. Yeah. I've been a victim of Islamophobia. I'm sure you've had a victim of some sort of Islamophobia in your time. Nobody saw Islamophobia like the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. You know, sometimes when some of our sisters who are watching these shows have to go to university and they wear their hijab on their way to the university, I, you know, I can never ever believe that my iman can be higher than the sisters who sit on those trains, on those buses, public transport, and they're being stared at in some countries, how can I get a higher position than them? Because that's true Iman. Now, the only way they can maintain that Iman is by holding on to the main man. Mm. And you said that the Quran mentioned that he's the man of the best example for you. Absolutely. And when eventually there is no trash being thrown at him, he goes to visit that lady. What's wrong? Why there's no trash being thrown at me? That level of akhlaq is phenomenal. That's divine. Yeah, because for many of us, our ego is hurt. Many of us will start a war. Many of us do, say, do you know who I am? Many, many. But he wanted to highlight that, you know what? When I'm telling you that I've come to perfect the mission of the prophets that have come before me, that's not going to be an easy task, but you'll never find me ever, ever failing it. Because if you can put a black dot on my CV, I shouldn't be a prophet of God. He asks you, they say to him, she's ill. He's like, let's visit her. She's mystified. Muhammad, why are you visiting me? Why are you visiting me? You don't feel, you know, I've been throwing trash at you. He's like, because this is what the religion teaches. As the Quran says, Jadilhum ahsan. Speak to them in that way which is better. It's hard for us. It is very hard, especially for, the, for one to comprehend. And, and for the Holy Prophet to come down, undoubtedly, very, very hard to the level of the intellect of the human. And the level of the intellect of the Arabs. Yeah. Arabs in some cases are crazy, they're still crazy. Not some cases, the Arabs until today are, in many cases are crazy. It doesn't matter who you are, you could be more learned than them, they'll tell you they're more learned than you. You could have studied the Quran more than them, they'll know the Quran better than you. You could have given a thousand majalis, he'll teach you how to give majalis. Imagine what he has to deal with. Yeah. But he showed the most sublime morals. Imam Ali alayhi salam at Safin. He doesn't have control of the water. Muawiyah does. We want some water. Muawiyah says, I'm not giving. When Imam Ali has control of the water, shows the most sublime morals. He said, let them drink. Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam witnesses that Hur bin Yazid al is in a sense of a crisis. Hur had an inclination towards Imami Shi'ism, as can be seen by his akhlaq with Imam Hussein, by telling him, you lead the prayers. There's clearly an Imami Shi'ism, which I think certain historians have not grasped in the clearest way that they 
could have, but Imam Al Hussein shows an unbelievable forgiving nature to Hur. Yes. So now, just uh, for a moment, sorry to interrupt you there. We're going to be going for a break. Inshallah, please do join us in the next couple of moments. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to tonight's live show on Imam Hussein TV where we're looking at the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, Muhammad, the moral exemplar as it were. Um, Sayyidina, assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam So just, um, I'm really enjoying this show tonight inshallah and um, we're just, if we just go back now to the life of the Holy Prophet yeah. as it were, um, in terms of character, morality, akhlaq, as it were, even adab, as it were. What can we take in today's time for people? So, for example, we've got a lot to get through, and that's why I'm sort of trying to get through a lot of material. In terms of, for example, um, should people marry young, as it were? What's, what happened around the wars at that time? Um, what, should, what, should, what lessons do we need to take from, from you know, the, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him? I, I think, think there's something many Muslims are scared to say okay. and that is there are certain aspects of the life of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon his family that in no way relate to our life today. Okay. Such as? Well I think marrying someone much younger than you while you're in your 50s um, and marrying someone who still you know is in the middle of adolescence right. I think in reality, that is something for that culture and that time. And I think there are certain people who, when they say the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, is the best example, I think, yes, there are many areas in which he's the best example for mankind, but there are certain areas that do not apply today to us. Right. I think there are people who are scared to say that because there are those who will try and prove that, no, a 54-year-old marrying someone who's... 10, 11, 12, 13 is something which is mm -hmm. acceptable. And I, I don't think a person should be scared to say, well, if it's acceptable at that certain juncture in the evolution of uh, mankind, mind you, there are, there are certain states in America that were allowing people to marry um, 12 and 13 year olds only until a few years ago. And then the states moved it to 15, 16, 18 and so on. But I think examples like that, we shouldn't be scared to say that, you know what, it doesn't necessarily apply in terms of for example, wars. I remember when Jordan Peterson was asked about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family, and, and he replied interestingly by saying, I'm, I'm not sure how to conclude on this because there's a number of wars that are there. Uh, firstly, he's not the only messenger of God who's gone through wars. Uh, secondly, if you're going to bring a certain new message, you're bound to have opposition. Um, and thirdly, I think that there are some wonderful lessons to be learned from those battles, ethically speaking, in terms of the way that he treated others. But I think we can also appreciate that the aim of the religion of Islam isn't just to always be involved in wars. No, no. Because some of his greatest moral achievements, in my opinion, which I think the world needs more of, are treaties like the Hudaybiyah Peace Treaty. Mm. You know, when I see Muslims talking about jihad and war and things like that, Many of them are very silent when it comes to the peace treaties, the constitutions where you can have a plurality of theological opinions in one country, right. where if I'm a Muslim or I'm a Christian or I'm Jewish, I can still live in peace with one another. And I think that aspect of the life of the Prophet, and I think these two are the most, you know, when you talk about lust and war, yeah. That's where medieval Europe had a scathing attack on the Prophet when they started to discuss him because this man is really seen as, as, a, as, as the nemesis in their opinion for Christ, an anti-Christ, mm -hmm. a person who's not showing that Christ is the greatest. And, and so they tried to focus on certain aspects of his life. 
where they wanted to attack him. Indeed, from, from another angle, one may argue there's more things, more examples from Muhammad's life you can take than you can take from Christ. Christ doesn't get married, Muhammad does. Right. Uh, Christ has no children, Muhammad does. Christ has never led on the battlefield, Muhammad does. Um, we don't really have many examples of Christ um, in his teens for us to learn from or in his 20s and 30s before what happens to him happens to him. Whereas there's so much of Muhammad the statesman, Muhammad the politician, Muhammad the general, Muhammad the father, Muhammad the son, Muhammad the orphan, Muhammad the wealthy, Muhammad with other religions, you know. So, you know, it can be looked at from, from different ways. Um, but I think that there are certain aspects of his life which I don't know how really applicable they are. And, and as I said, if we're reconstructing his biography from the Qur'an, then I think there are even certain verses in the Qur'an that don't apply at all okay. to the world that we live in today, okay. meaning that it may have applied to a 7th century Arabian environment, but may not necessarily have applied today. Sure, sure. Viewers do call in to ask questions to um, Dr. Sayyid Aman um, And also you can uh, also WhatsApp um, and text your questions also. Um, towards the end of the program, so now we'll focus on certain, uh, should we say, uh, um, verses that have been contentious in terms of interpretation, such as, for example, he frowned. We'll come back to that later sure. on in terms of the, the, the blind man and so on and so forth. But let's just move now steadily into the sort of main crux, as it were, of this um, show tonight in terms of morality. Um, I just want to read out a few verses as it were, the translation as it were, of yeah. Surah Hujurat. Um, verse 4, um, And as, as for those who call out to you from behind the private chambers, uh -huh. surely most of them do not understand. Mm. We'll come to that in terms of what does it exactly mean. And then another verse we have in the same uh, chapter, verse 6, O you who believe, if an evil doer comes to you with a report, Look carefully into it, lest you harm a people in ignorance. Then be sorry for what you have done. So that's verse 6. And then we have also verses 9 and 10. If two parties of the believers quarrel, make peace between them. But if one of them acts wrongfully towards the other, fight that which acts wrongfully until it returns to Allah's command. Then if it returns, make peace between them with justice and act equitably. Surely Allah loves those who act equitably. The final verse, verse 10. The believers are but brethren. Therefore make peace between your brethren and be careful of your duty to Allah that mercy be had on you. Um, why are these verses so pertinent, as it were, to today's show in terms of you know, morality, akhlaq. And I think if Surat al-Hujurat was called Surat al-Akhlaq, yeah. I think the name would be apt. The title would be apt. Of course, Allah is the wise and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the Prophet gives us these titles. Hujurat mm -hmm. is referring to your bedchamber. Right. Some of these, while the Prophet was in his bedroom, from outside the house, would be calling out, Muhammad, Muhammad, come down. Okay. Now, there's a few issues there and the lack of akhlaq which we can learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Firstly, that not all of these companions had the best akhlaq. No. Many of them were just, you know, Arabs, raw Arabs. Right. Some of them had buried their daughters alive. These guys need a lot more training. In some cases, how they became leaders, only Allah knows. But you find that, firstly, there's the lack of akhlaq. Secondly, when someone is in a particular honorable position, you don't call him on first name terms. No. For example, in Islam, the right of your fathers, you don't call him by his name. So none of us will ever say, my dad's called Ali, Ali, come here. Or my dad's called Jafar, Jafar, no, Baba. Some might say Sayyidna. Some might say Sheikhna. Some might say Hajj. But never will anyone call by their name. Likewise, even more those with knowledge. You know, if, if someone is a person of knowledge, people will say Sayyidna. People will say Sheikhna. Mm. If you call someone by their first name, either you're extremely close to them 
or you're taking the mick. Yeah. And we have candidates for both. And so here, when they're calling out Muhammad, the Quran says, in a way, stay strong. Many of them don't know. Those who call you with that type of tone or that type of rhetoric, it's not good akhlaq, but you maintain your composure. Then the next ayah said, a fundamental verse of akhlaq for communities. Okay. When an evil person comes to you with news about someone, verify it. Right. Otherwise, you may end up accusing someone of being ignorant and then regret what you've done. How many of us mm -hmm. have made a judgment on someone in the community we've later regretted? Yeah. How many of us? I've done it. You may have done it. Others have done it. You make a judgment about someone. Someone tells you this person's like this. And you believe it for the longest time. As in I think some of us who are more public figures will, uh, will know more about this than others. Where you really end up, it's not that people backbite. There are some who slander. So there'll be those who backbite you. And someone might ask, what's the difference between backbiting and slander? Ghiba and Namima. Ghiba, you're telling the truth about someone behind their back. Backbiting. You're telling the truth about them behind their back. Saying things which they wouldn't like you to say truthfully, but behind their back. Namima, you're telling a lie about them behind their back. And it's amazing how many Muslims see themselves as religious when many of them fall under the category of the people of Ghiba, Namima, Hamaz, Lamaz, Backbiters, slanderers, slandering one another and then later being, uh oh, I think I got it wrong. And what do they say later on? You know, sorry, I, uh, I got it wrong. I didn't mean to judge you in this way. And that poor family's life's destroyed, that poor couple's life's destroyed, uh, that poor Maulana's life's destroyed, others who have gone through difficult moments, their lives are destroyed because they don't apply this ayah. Imam al-Hasan was asked, what's the distance between truth and falsehood? He said four fingers between the ears and the eyes. What you hear in your ears, verify with your eyes. Someone told you person so-and-so is like this, person so-and-so is like this. Verify with your eyes. And not even just verify with your eyes. Listen, if you hear something about someone, there's no harm contacting the person. Listen, I heard that this was your opinion. You said this, you meant this, you did that, you meant that. You know, it's, it's very normal that we have this in our lives. But sadly, the Quran was trying to point to us Muslims that you are not an upright Muslim because of your prayers and the length of your prayers and the du'as and the tasbihs. But rather, it's when you hear a piece of news from somebody who's known to be a gossiper that you turn around and either say, listen, you've shot the arrow. I'm not going to make sure that it reaches. Or that you yourself tell him, look, verify it. Yeah. Where's the witnesses to this? Then in the next verses of Surah Al-Hujurat, The Quran says that surely the believers are brethren of one another. So reconcile between the brethren. One of the greatest pieces of akhlaq displayed by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, was to reconcile the tribes of the Arabs who used to despise each other. Be it in Medina or be it some Mecca and Medina. Be it the sulh, فَأَصْلِحُ Be it the sulh of Hudaybiyah or be it the sulh between the Aus and the Khazraj for example. You know sometimes when, when two believers have a problem with each other, you've got two types of people. Mufsidun wal Muslihun. The Mufsidun are the ones who try and exasperate the problem between the two. Don't listen to them, don't talk to them, don't reconcile. Yeah. If you reconcile, you're losing your strength, you're losing your valor, you're losing your, you know, bravery. Then you've got the one who says, you know what? Imam Ali alayhi salam, before he died, he said, reconciliation between two brethren is greater than mustahab fast and prayer. Yeah. Those of you who are praying mustahab prayer, salat al-layl, 
every night you see people praying Salat al-Layl, but they will not reconcile people, reconciliation of two brethren is greater than fasting and prayer. Right. So Surah Al-Hujurat, the aim of it was a number of verses. And I believe that these verses, if people just sit back and reflect on them, they act as a mirror for us and our behaviors. You have the next verse. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu. If you want to read verse 11, yeah. read the translation of verse 11 and just see how many points are akhlaqi points in verse 11. O oh, you who believe, let not one people laugh at another. People perchance, they may be better than they. Nor let women laugh at other women. Perchance, they may be better than they. And do not find fault with your own people, nor call one another by nicknames. Evil is a bad name after faith. And whoever does not turn, these it is that are the unjust. How many issues do you see there? First one, لا يسخر قوم من قوم عسى يكون خيرا منهم. Don't let one nation make fun of another nation. It may be that that nation is better than them. Sometimes you have Arabs making fun of Indians and Pakistanis. There are Arabs out or there. Versa, or vice versa. But you may find some Arabs in the Middle East make fun of Indians and Pakistanis. There's Indian, Pakistani. These are our servants in the Middle East. Listen, you can make fun as much as you want. Most billionaires in the world are in India, not with you. And sometimes even in our households and marriages, you come from one city, your wife comes from another. The family makes fun of her city until the poor girl cries. <laughs> then it says, and I didn't say it, so just in case someone writes in or the feminist establishment, you know, begin a campaign. But then the verse says, and don't let women make fun of other women. There are, in some cases, you know, petty disputes and squabbles that do occur. Even upright Shia woman, Sunni woman, Muslim woman, Go to the mosque, this one's in that group, this one's in that group, this group doesn't talk to this group, this group doesn't talk to her, she doesn't talk to them, this one makes fun of her, this one makes fun of Quran says, وَلَا نِسَاءٌ مِّن نِسَاءٍ عَسَىٰ أَن يَكُونُ خَيْرًا مِّنْهُمْ Then another small ayah in there, which I, listen, there are some of these which we've been guilty of even in our youth, you know, we may have been guilty of them. For example, وَلَا تَنَابَزُوا بِالْأَلْقَابِ Don't make nicknames. And how many of us have made nicknames? Mm -hmm. Believe you me, there are some of us made nicknames. We ruin people's lives. Yeah. You know, you, some make a nickname on someone. Imagine they name him after, for example, a, a film character. And he doesn't like to be named after that film character. Or after a politician. doesn't like to be named after a politician. Or after somebody. And, and imagine the kids hear someone putting that nickname on their dad. Yes, when we were teens. But when the kids grow up. If you read the next ayah, right. the next ayah is the most fundamental, okay. which affects all of us. Right. O oh, you who believe, avoid most of suspicion, for surely suspicion, in some cases, is a sin. And do not spy, nor let some of you backbite others. Does one of you like to eat the flesh of his dead brother? But you abhor it, and be careful of your duty to Allah. Surely Allah is off returning to mercy. Merciful. Unbelievable. O oh, you who believe, keep away from suspicion. Unbelievable how much, how, how many people in the Muslim community suspect each other of having done things. Where's the akhlaq? You know, what happened to that prophetic message beginning with Adam, ending with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family? Suspecting things about people's lives. No way to verify, no proof making these statements, unbelievable suspicion. You know, there is a tradition that says that God is willing to forgive, for example, adultery, but will not forgive suspicion. Mm -hmm. For suspicion can only be forgiven by those who you suspected. Right. I now suspect something about someone's life. I have no evidence about this, mm -hmm. no proof about this. Either my jealousy of them has led me to suspecting things about them. Yeah. I'm jealous of something related to them, so I want to suspect something. Sure. So I can spread a rumor in the community about them. And the confidence with suspicion, not just suspect, publicly go and damage people's lives with that suspicion. Quran said it's tenable kathiran min 
إن بعض الظن يظن. Then the Quran says, ولا تجسسوا and don't spy on one another. And believe you me, social media, I'm, I'm pro-social media in many ways. And sometimes those who are anti-social media are on social media more than those who are pro. But social media is like a knife. It can kill a human being or it can cut an orange. And social media, it's unbelievable how you could easily be addicted to spying on people. Now someone will say, but they're making their accounts public. Mm. Yeah, but you're literally spying, checking everywhere they've gone, what they're doing, what they're, until you become obsessed. Sure, sure. So now we have a question from uh, via WhatsApp. Um, Salam, my brother is Brother Ali from America. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. My question is how or what ways can we implement the akhlaq of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a society that condemns you if you do? I don't know which society condemns yeah. you if you are following those objective moral values that intrinsically as human beings we're all aware of. Perhaps he means uh, the open propagation as it were. Uh, or maybe like, like I said, you don't need to call it Mohammedan morals. Mm. Call it Abrahamic morals. Exactly. Call it the morals of Christ. Yeah. What difference is there from the morals of Christ to the morals of Muhammad? Peace be upon his family. These are all one line. Yeah. Viewers, we just have a few minutes, so do uh, call in or text or WhatsApp your questions. We've just got a few minutes now, say enough. Um, the, they are, I mean, what, we'll come to two or three questions, so I'm not sure how much time we have, and it really just depends on if someone calls in or not. But let's just take two points. What advice, say now, would you give to the viewers out there, particularly young, um, you know, um, in the West, in terms of, I wouldn't say adapting, but really incorporating the, the lessons from Ahlul Bayt and the Holy Prophet and the, yeah. the moral compass. What, what is the pivot? What should we use? And how can we actually spread the message in terms of our etiquette, manners, morality? and so Sometimes on? we can spread it without even saying a word. Mm. Just by people observing us. Invite people or be silent invite us to the way of God. Silent call us to the way of God. Right. Sometimes you may be sitting on a bus doing your tasbih. Yeah. Old lady walks in. You stand up, you say to her, please. You don't need to say at that moment, the Quran says if an old lady walks in, I must stand up. Yeah. Or the hadith says if an old lady walks in, I must. No. She'll notice the young man has a rosary bead. Wonderful. Secondly, the Ahlul Bayt themselves tell us, let the people know about our words. Believe you me, if you, you study some of the ethical lines of the Ahlul Bayt, people, if you didn't put Imam Ali under the quote and you put someone like Buddha, people will be like, yeah, that's amazing. You put Imam Ali, many don't know. No. Don't make promises when you're happy. Don't make decisions when you are angry. Wonderful ethical quote. How many of us have made a promise? When we're so happy and then we can't fulfill it. Or we made a decision when we're angry. Brothers are of two types. People have two types. They're brothers in faith or your equals in humanity. Lovely moral quote. Ali, son of Abu Talib. The Quran, for example, says, do not say the words Oof, to your parents. Don't be rude to them. Lower the wings of mercy. Let the people know the words of the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt. When you implement them, people will be attracted. When a non-Muslim walks into our mosque, sees, or a revert walks into our mosque, sees people are welcoming. That's more influential than having a brilliant lecture at the mosque. Sometimes you can have a brilliant lecture at the mosque, but if someone's walked in and no one's going to say, hello, how are you, where are you from, are you new here, do you need help? That's Islam. Islam comes in our interactions with each other. I personally believe Islam is a religion, if you look at the triangle, at the top is morality, theology, law. Okay. Triangle, morality at the top. Theology one side, law the other. I think now it's inverted. Mm. I think theology and law are most spoken about now. People have forgotten morality. Even in our Islamic seminaries, the focus is more on theology and law 
which are both fundamental sciences, but there's less focus on ethics. Yes, akhlaqiyat yes, is taught. Yes, there are certain works of Tusi and for example Naraqi mm -hmm. and for example others who are taught in, in the Hawza when it comes to akhlaq. Yes. But mainly when someone goes to Hawza, you normally hear how much fiqh they've done. Yeah. Or secondly, maybe how much theology. But when it comes to Quran and akhlaq, these seem to be at the bottom of the studies at yeah. the moment. Whereas when Islam began, akhlaq was at the top. Okay, uh, producers, can you just remind us once again how much time we have left? Um, uh, all so night, I think. I think um, that's all we have time for um, at the moment. Just maybe just before we go, very quickly perhaps, uh, hardly 60 seconds. There's a particular verse in the Holy Quran which talks about he frowned and the blind man. If you can possibly just very quickly. Well, I, th I, I personally, I'm not a prophet and I've never frowned at a blind man. And I, I can, I'm in disbelief that they would say my prophet would frown at a blind man. And I don't care if he's a Shi'i or a scholar from other schools in Islam. For them to justify by saying, well, he's blind. He can't see when you frown. Give me a break. Yeah. This man, the most sublime morals you'll ever see. If I can't frown at a blind man and I have a soft heart for him, then how about the man who had the softest heart? Okay, so now that's all we have time for tonight. Inshallah, inshallah, hopefully should be able to join us next week again.